Hey, brother! Ben, have you ever noticed that Luna Lovegood and Severus Snape are, like, basically the same person? It's like, geez, book, stop beating us over the head with it. We get it! Oh, sorry, is that not an obvious parallel there? Okay, well, then let's just jump right into it. Today, we're discussing why Luna is basically Snape. <laughs> Something new we are launching this year is a Super Carlin Brothers newsletter so you can stay up to date with whatever it is we're doing, whether that's coffee or meetups or exclusive merchandise. If you want to get information and updates about that, I'm going to put a link to it in the description down below. And as an added bonus, if you are one of the first 200 people to sign up for the email list, you will get a free trial membership in the Super Carlin Brothers Discord where you can hang out with me and Ben and the rest of the very super duper awesome Super Carlin Brothers community. You do need to be at least 13 to join the discord but any age is allowed on the email list again i will put the link in the description down below so i have to tell you one of the biggest most annoying things every time i reread through the harry potter books is james potter we know he goes on to be a great father and sirius can never stop saying great things about him he joined the order of the phoenix he was head boy and just no one ever has anything mean to say about him except snape who honestly just cannot even shut up about it a common bit of advice when you're writing anything is always to show and not tell. So for example, if you wanted to establish a character as a thief, it's much better to have us, the audience, see them steal something rather than hear about the time they stole something. And this phenomenon is what makes James Potter so odd because we only ever hear great things about him, but whenever we see him like in a flashback or something, he's being like a total arrogant jerk face. We know eventually he turns things around but we never get to see how it happens. And it's kind of a missing gap in the story because James Potter's arrogance in particular is extremely important to the future of the entire wizarding world. His arrogance is a direct influence on Snape, who, despite being a fairly noble person capable of loving other people, cannot get over being bullied as a child, and it leads him down the path to the dark side. It seems so trivial, just a schoolyard rivalry that you grow out of, but it is a huge plot point in the Harry Potter series. And James's attitude as a boy ends up being his fatal flaw, the thing that gets him killed. And also being hit by the killing curse. Being bad at dodging, also a terrible fatal flaw. Which is why I personally keep insisting they include dodgeball as part of the core curriculum at Hogwarts, but no one ever listens to me, but I always have such great ideas, whatever. Anyway, I think part of the reason we don't get to see how James turns things around is because he's supposed to serve as an example for what Harry could have become, what Harry has to correct in his own life if he is going to correct the past. And he is not alone. Each member of Harry's core group of friends, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, Neville, and Luna, all pair up extremely nicely with a character from the Marauders era, with Harry's generation serving as the best version of their foil, how they might have turned out if they had approached things just a little bit differently. Harry, as we said, is pretty easy. He's obviously the present day equivalent of James and like James is tested with arrogance. James willingly accepts all of the glory and popularity that comes with being a star Quidditch player and freely abuses all of the power it affords him over the other students to his eventual downfall. Harry, on the other hand, is pretty much the most selfless person ever. He never gloats, well, mostly. She's only interested in you because she thinks you're the chosen one. But I am the chosen one. Yes, he does have tremendous pride in Gryffindor and wants them to win, and he does hate Slytherin, but he also dies for everyone and then comes back to life and saves the day, so yeah, history corrected. Next is the pretty obvious comparison between Ron and Sirius. Both act in the best friend role, and both are trying to emerge from the shadow of their family, but in very different ways. Sirius is trying to stand out as being very different from his all Slytherin family, where Ron is just trying to stand out, full stop. I'm Quidditch captain too! Hello, good. They both play the best friend role, but Sirius often wants to take things just one step too far. His desire to separate himself from his family is so strong, he is willing to push the boundaries and do dangerous things, because what could possibly be better than being the best student in the school and doing it in defiance of all of his Slytherin family? as a Gryffindor. Ron, on the other hand, despite desperately wanting to be the best, happily accepts the supporting
supporting role. Or, well, maybe not happily. It is still a bit of a struggle. After all, he does abandon Harry for like half of Goblet of Fire. Wrong ways, like Harry Potter's stupid friend. Then does abandon Harry and Hermione in Deathly Hallows. But eventually, he makes the right call, returns to the group, and is forever remembered as one of the bravest students to ever attend Hogwarts. Moving on, though, Hermione rounds out the Golden Trio and is the modern day equivalent of Remus. Both are awarded the prefix title with hopes that they can rein in their more rule breaking friends. Both are the bookworms of the group, and most importantly, both have to overcome extreme prejudice in the wizarding world. Remus for being a werewolf, Hermione for being a muggleborn. Is there anything wrong with being either of these things? No. But does it affect them? Mm. Hermione? Absolutely not. Remus? It's pretty much his whole character. Well, that and the complete state of shabbiness of his robes. Mm, you know what? Not even robes, just himself. He himself is shabby. I'm surprised by the end of the books, he's not just a pile of clothes on the floor with like a name tag on it. Tonks, is there a reason you're not doing that laundry? Excuse me, that is my husband. He is a wonderful man. You do not want to be near that pile of robes on the full moon, okay? Hermione, though, is the cleverest witch of her year. And even though she receives a lot of abuse for being muggle-born from Malfoy and company, you filthy little mob blood. She doesn't let it get to her, it just slides off. She lets her magic do the talking. Or sometimes her fists. Remus, on the other hand, is just as equally qualified as Hermione, maybe a little outshone by Sirius and James, but at the end of the day, he is completely ashamed of what he is and lets it affect everything. He doesn't want to get too close to anybody, he doesn't want to get married, he doesn't want to have kids, he stops being a teacher, it just controls his life. Next up we have Ginny and her pretty obvious correlation with Lily. But honestly, I don't have too much to say about these two. They're both the beautiful, talented, red-haired slug club member love interest of the black-haired kid with glasses. It's not as much for Ginny to correct because Lily is kind of different from the other characters in her generation in that she's a pretty flawless character, which is kind of essential to the story because it makes her sacrifice so meaningful. I do have a little bit more to say about them a little later, but for now, let's jump into the fun ones. First up, Neville versus Peter Pettigrew. Oh, Peter, how very, very different you might have been. Oh, when you see what Neville becomes, it makes you crazy that Peter wasn't just a little bit more courageous, a little more confident, or maybe just a little more supported by his friends. The two both start out as the pudgy Gryffindor kid that nobody is quite sure about. And both suffer from fear, which is an unusual trait in a Gryffindor, but how they deal with it really defines both of them. Why is it always me? Peter never really overcomes it at all. Instead, he just relies on the other most powerful people around him to protect him, which almost definitionally means that he will always be attracted to whoever has the most power, which makes him an incredibly unloyal person. And that trait in particular is what will define his whole character and later on, kill him. His disloyalty to his friends are what causes James and Lily's death. You sold James and Lily to Voldemort, didn't you? And his later disloyalty to Voldemort, even for just half a second, is what causes his own death. On the other end of the spectrum, though, we have Neville freaking Longbottom. Woo! That kid ain't so chubby anymore. Similar to Peter, he starts out not feeling very brave and constantly losing his toad. He even asked the Sorting Hat to put him in Hufflepuff because he didn't think he belonged in Gryffindor. But we all know what a mistake that would have been and how much potential he really has. I mean, even McGonagall recognizes that there's nothing wrong with his work, he just lacks the confidence. Neville, with a little support from Harry, Ron, and Hermione, begins to conquer his fears as early as book one when he tries to stop them from going out after the Philosopher's Stone. This is in stark contrast with the brief amount of time we get to spend with the Marauders as teenagers, where they are quick to criticize and ridicule Peter for not knowing some of the identifying factors of a werewolf. To be fair though, he really should know that stuff though, right? Come on. But again, it's a great example of Harry's humility versus James' arrogance. James is all too happy to protect Peter because of just how great he, James, is. Whereas Harry starts an army and literally trains Neville to be the leader of said army after he is gone. The real tragedy of it all is that despite Peter's wickedness and inability to overcome his fear, you still see that much like Neville, he had quite a bit of potential. He evaded Sirius Black, one of the best students of his year, blowing up an entire street and killing 12 people in the process. He became an Animagus, even though it took a little help, he still got there, and he hunted down and revived the Dark Lord. I mean, <laughs> it's quite the resume. 
If only you'd used your powers for good, Peter. You could have started a rebellion. You could have chopped the head off Nagini. Which I think we can all agree was as awesome as it gets. But can also agree that it was a little extra layer of darkness to it now that we know that Nagini was a human at one time. And if you're keeping score, you should know that that leaves us with just one final pairing, which may surprise you, but 100% should not. Snape and Luna. These two represent the outcast, and although I can hardly count the number of pages where they actually share a scene together, Luna is the absolute echo of Snape. She shows just how different history could have been if Snape was just a little more accepting of himself. Snape and Luna were both bullied at school, but honestly, you might not even realize how bullied Luna was. She believes in things that no one else believes in, despite them being complete nonsense. People hide her stuff, they call her names, but she always just lets it slide right off her. Keeps away the narcos. The scene to me that always stands out as a great example of this is when she's putting up signs at the end of the year for people to give her her stuff back, and Harry offers to help her look for her stuff, and she's just like, it'll show up. Snape, on the other hand, geez, man, he can't let a single solitary thing go. Like, ever, 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 always, ever, ever, ever. Even after a decade later and he's still in love with the same woman who is dead now and he has sworn to protect her son, he is still a total butt to Harry at all times just because Harry's dad was a butt to him. The irony here is of course Ginny and Lily. Ginny ends up probably being Luna's best friend. She protects her from others and admires her for embracing who she is. Lily tries to offer the same kind of comfort to Snape, but in the end, and he cannot get over it. He allows himself to be defined by being bullied and drives Lily away. Which is a total shame because they totally could have remained friends and Snape seems to have been a pretty powerful and clever wizard. And there you go, Ben. That is why Luna is actually Snape. Just like a thousand times better though. Personally, what I kind of love about comparing one generation to the next in this way is that in Harry's generation in particular, you can see that not only do they make the correct decision for themselves, but because they do, the others all benefit from it. And as a unit, they are able to overcome and eventually correct all of the mistakes of the past. Ben, my question for you and everyone else is, what do you guys think? Do you agree with our pairings? Would you have paired people up any differently? Let us know your thoughts in the towel section down below. Just because Neville asked not to be in Hufflepuff doesn't mean they don't serve great pancakes. Get your hands on a Lion's Snakes Eagles Cakes t-shirt today at supercarlinbrothers.store. Guys, thanks as always so much for watching. Please leave a like on this video if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter content from us. If you'd like to see how Luna is actually slowly turning into a wolf, you can check out this video right here. Or if you'd like to see how Snape is actually Kylo Ren, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you in another life, brother.